Syria will open two new crossing points from Turkey to the country's rebel-held northwest to deliver desperately needed aid to earthquake victims. NATO members discuss accelerating the supply of arms to Ukraine, but combat planes appear to be off the table. Poland trains Ukrainian troops on Leopard 2 tanks as Kyiv braces for a new Russian offensive. Syria's president has agreed to open two new crossing points from Turkey to the country's rebel-held northwest to deliver desperately needed aid to help millions of earthquake victims. The UN has only been allowed in the Idlib area through a single crossing. It's severely hampered help getting through. On Monday night, the death toll from the February 6 earthquake surpassed 37,000. Now delivering food, health, shelter and other life-saving supplies to those more fortunate takes top priority. One week on from the quakes in Syria and Turkey, hopes of finding anyone who has survived trapped under the rubble is dwindling fast. Hussein Berber, who was rescued in the 183rd hour of the earthquake, may be one of the last exceptions. The rescue phase appears to be drawing to a close. It's for the living that concern is growing. Children's lives have been uprooted and they're surrounded by death and destruction. Thousands of them have lost their parents and conditions are harsh outside. It's the wintertime and temperatures are freezing. There's an obvious risk of major health issues to come for adults and children alike. NATO members hope to accelerate the supply of arms to Ukraine as they meet in Brussels on Tuesday ahead of Russia's announced spring offensive. Kyiv is asking for long-range missiles and combat planes. But NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg made no mention of those when he set out his priorities ahead of the talks. Our top priority, the urgent need now, is to ensure the heavy weaponry, the modern air defense systems, the ammunition, uh, all the other things we need to ensure that uh, Ukraine gets uh, the uh, uh, advanced and, and, uh, and modern systems which are already being pledged and that can really make a difference on the battlefield. All decisions on arms supplies to Ukraine are taken in this forum, set up and chaired by the United States and in which some 50 countries participate. But the risk of stoking tensions and further escalating the conflict remains a major concern. And the problems don't end there. As Stoltenberg now claims Kyiv is getting through weapons faster than it's producing them, putting more pressure on its defence industry and raising the prospect of depleting stocks. With Ukraine bracing itself for a much-expected new offensive from Russia, some of Kyiv's troops are participating in training sessions on Leopard 2 tanks in Poland. It's part of the European Union's military assistance to Ukraine. Polish President Andrzej Duda was there to see for himself. Warsaw is among the most active supporters of neighboring Ukraine and has pushed European nations to provide the tanks. Russia is likely to try to secure territory it illegally annexed in late September and where it claims its rule is welcomed. Before and after images show the destruction of the Donetsk region where the Kremlin's troops are currently engaged in frontline battles. Russia is also claiming to have taken the village of Krasnohora near Bakhmut. It mentions volunteer assault units being used, a rare admission from Russia's army that fighters from the notorious Wagner paramilitary group were involved. In the city of Kherson, which was once under Russian control, there's much needed help from volunteer doctors. With Russian shelling continuing, the residents risk coming out of shelters to seek treatment for chronic conditions neglected under the occupation. A depiction of happiness which masks something far more sinister. These are children from Donbass and other Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine who were taken to be handed over to Russian families and given Russian nationality. President Putin's Commissioner for Children's Rights defends it as an act of love for orphan children who have no one to take care of them. But an investigation by the EBU Investigative Journalism Network reveals that many of these kids do have families and were taken to Russia under false pretenses or without their consent.
Um, not only is forcible transfer a war crime, but also adopting children during time of war is, is also completely against international law. But Russia changed its laws in May to allow these children to be given Russian nationality, and that's happened in hundreds of cases. <laughs> Injured children were also taken to filtration camps. Alexander went to one of them with his mother. She was interrogated and didn't pass the screening process. The young boy said he wasn't even allowed to say goodbye. Alexander's grandmother was able to rescue him before he was transferred. They have no news of what's happened to the mother. Natalia sent her daughter to a summer camp organized by Moscow-designated authorities in Kozachilopanya, one of the first Ukrainian cities to be occupied. She was able to see her daughter Karina again, but other mothers haven't been so fortunate. Does she think that the Russians want to keep the children? Ukraine says this is akin to genocide, while this human rights lawyer says it goes beyond a war crime. Well, the, the, the forcible transfer of children, as, as we see it, is, is, is clearly a war crime. But it's also a crime against humanity, um, because it is being carried out on a widespread and systematic uh, level, but also because it's being carried out in the context yeah. of crimes against humanity. The mystery of four unidentified flying objects in North American airspace is straining already frosty relations between Washington and Beijing. The U.S. claimed the first UFO was a Chinese spy balloon, part of a larger high-altitude intelligence-gathering program. The other three are so far unexplained, but the White House has been clear what they are not. I know there have been questions and, and concerns about this, but there is no, again, no indication of aliens or extraterrestrial activity. Even so, the White House defended the decision to shoot down the objects. First, it was because they are a danger to commercial air traffic. Now the U.S. says China has a balloon program connected to its army. Even though we had no indications that any of these three objects were surveilling, we couldn't rule that out. And so there, you know, you, you want to err on the side of safety here in terms of protecting our national security. Beijing initially dismissed the U.S. as overreacting, but has now claimed that Washington has previously sent balloons into Chinese airspace. Claims and counterclaims of espionage between the two superpowers is just the latest diplomatic row in an already tense relationship. Climate activists last generation have begun a fortnight of protests in Austria, starting with the blockade of a main road in Vienna's city centre. This will group glued themselves to the road surface. Their aim is to disrupt morning traffic and raise environmental awareness. Last generation believe they are the last generation to stop the serious impact of climate change. They describe themselves as a non-violent resistance movement. Shane Perlman was a digital nomad for 23 years, until he settled in the Canary Islands with his family. After months of tedious paperwork, he's managed to start a new business in Spain, Ray People, and now he helps other professionals to follow his path. I saw an idea. I, I saw actually this digital nomad community and said, look, we need to create solutions to make it really easy for families to be flexible. And I couldn't because I had the wrong visa type. 
To avoid this, a new visa will allow digital nomads to stay in Spain for up to three years. It's part of a new startup law to attract high value professionals like Shane and to make them part of the creative community. I mean, like you use the word nomad, but nomad is really just a weird form of tourism. But when you can break that outsider cycle, when somebody can be there just long enough to, you know, start to get to know your neighbors, that's where chemistry so evolves. That's where innovation happens. That's where jobs get created. Uh, and that takes a little time. He visited Madrid to share his experiences at an event organized by ENISA, the Spanish National Innovation Company. En eventos como este es donde empresas españolas y nómadas digitales establecen relaciones y posibles alianzas. Se trata de crear un pool de talento a disposición del ecosistema startup español. ¿Qué tal? The new startup law also includes tax advantages for investors, workers and startups in their first five years. Sobre todo son los años donde necesitan retener más talento para luego poder crecer. Por eso también las deducciones tanto en stock options y también las deducciones por inversión son fundamentales. The law will benefit 23,000 startups like Combo Rebi at La Nave, Madrid's municipal innovation incubator. After three years, this startup is ready to launch its first products. Porque al fin y al cabo, eh, el, todo el tiempo que estás desarrollando el producto, hasta que no lo lanzas al mercado y no empiezas a tener unos clientes iniciales, pues es todo un desembolso que tienes que, que, tienes que realizar tú. Having passed his first stage, Torres faces another challenge, to continue growing.